And you can read more about Heather on the next slide. She has a bio. I'm not going to read all of it because it's pretty extensive and she's um, currently serving as an ESL supervisor. She's got a lot of experience behind her and as well as Tara Schaub who is the next presenter. And so this, this slideshow will be up on our website at coabe.org under professional resources um, webinars. So if you wanna read more about them, the slides will be there for you. So I'm going to turn this right over to Heather and Tara so we can get going with our webinar. Thank you again, everyone, and we'll see you soon at the end. Hello, this is Tara Schwab. And Heather Martin. And we're going to be talking about how to use games in your classroom and how it can be not only a way for your students to kind of um, be more engaged. And I see in our chat box, we have people from all over the country, um, but the programs that Tara and I work in here, our classes often run for up to four hours. Uh, so we also use games to kind of motivate our students and keep them active throughout um, the long class period, especially when it's in the evening. So I will let Tara go ahead and start. Okay, welcome. It's so great to see again, to see where everyone is from. So of course I see we're all adult educators here and on that note, I'm gonna give you a minute to read this first slide before I make a few comments um, about why we use games. But um, Heather and I just wanted to point out, we realize that some of the research that we've put in this slide is a little bit on the older end. However, um, some of the more recent um, pieces of research and some data that we came across that are having to do with this uh, mentioned learning with children specifically. But of course, um, all of the, the theory and practice um, is good for adults as well. So we just wanted to mention, you know, why we kept these particular pieces in here because they speak particular, particularly to our areas and for adult learning. So I'll give you a minute to read this slide before we make a couple comments here. Okay, so I just wanted to point out a couple of things. Um, in our second point, uh, it talks about getting feedback and practicing sharing, reflecting, and small group activities. Uh, we're really going to try in each slide uh, with some of the games that we suggest to talk about how you can use those group activities to really enhance learning and with these games. But a lot of times we'll expand that to how this could be used for you know, individuals or entire class games. So we're really going to try to mix it up there. Um, and give you some different ideas for, you know, the grouping and also for ESL, ABE, ASC, so we can really kind of work across adult education. Okay, so as I kind of mentioned in our intro, um, why can you play games? One advantage to playing games is grouping the students. And so when we group the students, you can do that in many different ways, um, depending on your needs and your student population. So of course you can group them by levels. Uh, you can either do that based on putting more like homogenous groups together. You can have your um, maybe students that are struggling um, in one group and then your students that are more advanced in another. You can also do the opposite and make sure that you have mixed levels for each group so that way your more advanced students are kind of guiding your students that are facing some challenges and they can help them out and kind of use that group dynamic to not only further their learning and their comprehension, but you can also, um, it, they gain confidence and it gives them an opportunity to learn from their peers rather than listening to the same voice over and over and over, which is in most cases, I'm sure yours or mine. Um, another way you can group is by subject. Um, if your students have different needs in class, maybe one student is going to be, or one group is going to be working on social studies content, one will be working on language arts, you can group that way. Um, or if you're in an ESL classroom, if you have a group that needs help with vocabulary and maybe another group is focused more on comprehension, then you can differentiate it that way. 
um, different skills obviously kind of fits in with the others or you can just do random groups and this is kind of nice um, in the beginning because a lot of times our students do have a lot of confidence issues or they're very shy when they first come to class so just kind of putting them in groups um, randomly is a way to get them to start interacting with each other and kind of have fun and let their guard down so even the social benefit um, of random grouping can be great even if you're not kind of focusing on honing a particular skill um, and then another good game or another good way to use games is it's a great way to review for any type of assessment or just as a culminating activity uh, it builds confidence less anxiety as we discussed a lot of our students whether you teach in the esl or abe arena ase um, our students have a lot of confidence issues sometimes, often because their prior schooling um, kind of brings back negative, they had negative experiences, um, uh, especially on the ABEASE side of things. Um, so it builds confidence, they less anxiety. It's a way for you to kind of assess them without them feeling like they're being assessed. And a lot of times they'll be so distracted by the game, they won't really be that um, anxious about the content and showing their knowledge either. And then the last point is just that um, you can engage in these activities to re-energize or reinvigorate the room. Like I said earlier, Tara and I often teach classes that are up to four hours long uh, that sometimes don't end until 9.30 or 10 o'clock at night. And a lot of our students have put in 10 or 12 hour days at work, or they've been taking care of their kids all day, or they're going after class to start work for third shift. So um, making sure you kind of re-energize things and getting them up and moving, or at least just moving around um, using motor skills instead of sitting at the desk is a great way to make sure that they're still engaged, especially at the end of a long day or night. All right, our slide seems to be frozen. One minute. Oh, there we go. There we go. So this game is something that is really fun and it can be used in a lot of the ways that we talked about. It can be used in small groups. It can be used um, throughout, you know, with the whole class. It can also be used, kind of Heather was talking about how we teach for a number of hours in one class. So this could be used at any point throughout the night just to kind of mix things up after one lesson or for a review for a test. So it really has a lot of different applications in the class. So the way the question ball works is that you take um, pieces of paper and just break them apart into pieces and you crumble them up. And so you write something on your piece of paper, for example, if you are doing a um, constitution review, you can write different amendments on the piece of paper or different uh, maybe branches of government, responsibilities for those branches of government. You put them on the scrap of paper and you wad them up into a big ball. So basically you're just crumbling all your little pieces of paper into a ball. And then you throw the ball to the students. The students then take a piece of paper off the outside of the ball. I can't hear you for some reason. Oh, is it, hello? Can so, you hear me now? Uh, yes, now we can. That's, we, we okay. We just missed just about 30 seconds. Oh, all right. Sorry about that. Now, so, yeah, now, now it's fine. <laughs> For the question ball, I will, sorry if this is a repeat, I'm not sure where the audio kind of uh, left, but anyway, you take scraps of paper and crumple them up.
questions or concepts on there, such as um, demonstrate one of the properties. You can order of operation, or you can put an equation on there and have the student answer it. And oh, is it getting? I see in the chat window that it's having problems. I think okay. Me a second. No, that's you okay. Might. I just wanted to make sure. Again, just for math, arts, story concepts, vocabulary terms, social studies would be. Here's your science. You could do terms. Well. Sorry about audio issues there. Is target just on that box? A target number. You'll put a target on, a target number on the board. For example, let's say your number will have to draw cards. They'll and you can decide how many cards they'll draw. Let's say for the sake of our game, we're drawing three cards. Okay, and they draw a two, a seven, and a three. So they have to figure out how they can manipulate those numbers to get closest to that target number of 25. So seven times three is 21 plus two is 24, which gets you all, or sorry, 23. Whoops, still talking a little faster than my brain is working. Sorry about that. And thank you for not putting that in the chat window. <laughs> and, um, and then the, oh, thank you. And target number does need to be. Um, and then they would be close to 25. So each student would get a specific number of cards to get to the number. Now, this is kind of a vague description because there are so many possible modifications. You can modify the target number. For example, if you're working with a group of ESL students or low ABE students, you might want to make sure that your target number is below 30 or below 20. If you are working with more advanced students, you might want to raise that target number. Similarly, you might want to have them only draw two cards or three cards, but if they're more advanced students, you may have them draw five cards and try to reach a three-digit number potentially, or six cards, seven cards. Um, you can also modify depending on what operations you allow them to use. Maybe some of your students are only going to be using addition and subtraction, whereas other students will be using multiplication and division. You can decide whether you want some of them to function as two digit numbers or whether every card has to be a one digit number. So these are all different ways you can modify, but basically the students are just getting random numbers in the form of their cards that they've drawn and trying to figure out what equations they can perform in order to get as close to the target number as possible. All right, the next math, and again, we will go back and answer any questions in a minute. The next math game we have is the area game. And the area game, for the area game, you will need graph paper and two different colored pencils or crayons, markers, and then two dice. So you'll split the graph paper into two equal parts by drawing a line down the middle. It kind of looks like a tennis court, I guess, to me, when you've drawn the line down the middle. And that line creates the territory. So one player has 
one side of the graph paper, the other and potentially let's say a red marker, and the other player on the other side has a blue marker. So it's the players are going to roll the dice. And then they have to draw the square or rectangle that has the dimensions of the numbers on the dice. So then whichever player crosses over into the opposite territory loses the game. So it's kind of like Tetris where you're trying to fit these shapes into your rectangle, your larger rectangle on the graph paper, and trying not to go into your opponent's territory. And one way, and you can also do it, you can do it with dice, you can do it with cards, um, as long as they're getting two numbers. If you want to make this game a little more difficult, you can have them, um, sorry, I'm distracted by the chat box, I will answer that question in a minute. You can have them um, draw or roll a larger number, and then they can determine how they're going to draw that box. So for example, if you're using it so that the dice represent the uh, dimensions of the shape, then if the student rolls a two and a two, they're drawing a square, a two by two square. If they roll a four, if you're having them, if you're giving them a little more leeway, right, having them do a little bit more of the math computations, then if they roll a four, they could either do a two by two box or they could do a four by one rectangle. So they can decide kind of how they are choosing to set up their boxes so that they can fit it into their area. And just the basic instructions, I know there have been a lot of questions about the basic instructions of that. You have a graph paper, each player, there are two players, each gets one half of the paper. There's a line down the middle. They will roll the dice, so that they can um, get the dimensions of the squares and rectangles that they will be drawing on their side. And they are trying not to cross over into their opponent's territory. So basically they're trying to Tetris all these squares and rectangles together so that they stay on their half of the graph paper. All right, that is, I believe the last of our math games. So we do have some questions that we will take time to answer. Um, the first question I see in the question box is, is it one dice per student? And the answer would be that depends on how you're choosing to play it. If you want the students to roll their dimensions of the square and the rectangle, then they would each have a pair to themselves. If you want the students to roll the perimeter or the area, then they can each have one dice and then they would be responsible for the determining um, how those shapes are going to look in order to achieve that area or perimeter. Um, all right, then the next question, there was, um, I believe it was answered, let's see. I'm sorry, I'm just scrolling back so I can see all these questions. We can type up instructions and send them to Liz. Liz, is that, does that work for you? We have notes that we're using so that we don't forget anything. So we can just make them a little bit more, you know, usable and go ahead and send them over to Liz. So that's no problem at all. Yes, Liz has yeah. said that that works for her. So she will make sure that the documents with the instructions for the games are um, accessible with the PowerPoint, which answers one of the other questions. Is this going to be accessible later? Yes, it is. Um, so uh, let me see if there are any other questions that we've missed. Um, yes, thank you. Haven, you can even let learners use triangles, parallelograms, et cetera, for their areas. Absolutely. That's a great way to modify the, um, the area game is just by allowing them to use more complex shapes, do more complex um, equations. And obviously you'd modify, you know, whether they're drawing cards or rolling dice, you'd modify that accordingly uh, with how many they get and things like that. Thank you for that suggestion. All right. Um, this is also being recorded. So in addition to being able to access the instructions, you will also, another question had come up about, you know, can we listen to this again? And yes, 
um, Liz just put up there, um, you know, that it is going to be accessible on the webinar resources, um, on the COAB website, and some instructions are there in the chat box. Um, but please do know, yes, um, you can listen to this again, and you'll also be able to print it out, and you'll get our instructions and, and everything. And then one last modification I wanted to make um, for the area game. I know we've kind of uh, ignored our ESL population during this math, <laughs> math lesson, um, but for the area game, a lot of our ESL students, especially our lower students, are still working on their numbers and vocabulary. So with our lower ESL students, it's quite easy to just have them color the number of boxes um, that's, on the, that's on the dice or that's on the card that they draw, if that's how you're playing. Uh, they can also use it to find simple sums, right? If they roll like a three and a five, and then they can color in the three boxes and the five boxes and add them up to eight boxes. So you can really modify this however you'd like, but it really is a very easy way to allow your students to get a very tangible uh, visualization of the numbers. So for our ABEASE students that are working on, you know, kind of higher, um, just uh, order whatever math, we, you can use the different um, operations. And then with our ESL students and our lower ABE students, it can be as simple as just providing them that visual, uh, that tangible visual cue for the different numbers. So, and Liz also suggested that um, you can adapt it for algebra, uh, which is definitely, oh, I'm oh, sorry. I it's, sent that back to Liz. oh, sorry. Nope. Okay. That was from us to Liz. It can be modified for algebra, adjust the requirements. Yes. So whoever asked, could this game be modified for algebra? I somehow sent that privately to Liz. Um, but the answer would be yes. You can certainly adjust the target number game for algebra because you can modify the requirements that you would like students to do to reach the target number. So you could certainly modify the target number game for algebra. Yes, really good question and good point. And to respond to Diana's comment about my assumption that ELL students are not able to do higher order thinking, that is in no way what I was assuming, I was um, specifically referring to the math that is often associated with the curriculum for those levels of ESL. So I am 100% aware that our ELL students are able to do higher order thinking. However, I also know that typically the um, math demands of the curriculum associated with their level of proficiency um, don't necessarily reflect their math abilities. However, those are typically the math standards that are in those lower levels. So I apologize if it seemed like I was assuming that they didn't know how to do higher order thinking or math. Um, I just meant that typically the math standards that are associated for those lower and uh, lower intermediate classes uh, do not contain more complex math problems. Okay, I think we got to the points and the questions that were there for the math games. We will certainly have some time at the end to answer questions as well. So please go ahead and keep them coming. We're trying to kind of switch off, um, you know, so the person who's not talking is trying to type some answers to the questions as we go. But certainly we already discussed with Liz that there's some time at the end to answer more questions. So please go ahead and jot those down or put them in the chat so we can get to those questions at the end. So now we're gonna move on to some games here for, that actually we'll try to still include ideas for, for math and other subjects, but um, they're just kind of broken up for the first category, sometimes with language arts and social studies or civics and so forth. So this game is called the hot seat. So please imagine with me that you have a student who you have one chair sitting in front of your whiteboard or your chalkboard facing out to the class. But you have some space behind that chair that the teacher can sneak around behind whoever is sitting in that chair. So 
what you do here for the hot seat is you divide the class into two teams and have them sit on you know um, either side of the room. So team one sits all together, team two sits all together. And on the board, you're gonna write team one, underline, team two, underline. And a student from team one comes up to sit in the hot seat. And you go ahead and write a term on the board. So this term could be something that is related to vocabulary that you're studying. Or it could be a term for studying for a civics test. It could be a character from a book that you, the class is reading together. So whatever lesson or unit or semester is related to what you're trying to study, you write a term on the board. So the students from that team, from team one, try to get their person in the hot seat to say the term that's on the board behind them without using starts with, rhymes with, or any part of the word to describe it to their teammate. So as the teacher, you'll wanna give the hot seat victim a certain number of time that you keep consistent. So I typically start with 30 seconds. So team one has 30 seconds to try to get their person to say the term that's behind them on the board without using starts with, rhymes with, or any part of the word. Sometimes, um, you know, depending, I can go ahead and talk about a couple modifications. Sometimes I'll let the students use their notes, you know, the people who are trying to give the clues, depending on sometimes the length of the unit or how long we've been studying it, it just kind of depends. So when the 30 seconds are up, if the team one get, if that person in the hot seat gets the answer, team one gets a point. Sometimes if they don't get it, I'll get, I'll give team two a chance to steal the answer. Sometimes I don't. So then that person goes back to their seat. Someone from team two gets into the hot seat and we do this all over again. So when that person sits down, then the next person that's next to victim one from team one gets into the hot seat and I do it again. So it's nice because this is a way, I typically don't say, you know, someone else volunteer from team one. I just go around the room and say, okay, you're next, hot seat. Um, so it's a nice way to get everyone involved. So obviously, you know your students and you can kind of, you know, choose that however works best for you. You could have four teams, you know, um, teachers, of course, you'll want to have all your terms ready. We've, you know, learned over the years that, of course, you don't want to wing it. So you want to have as many terms as possible um, ready to put up on the board. Uh, this is such a fun game. I've done it just quickly when I notice that students need a break. Oh, that's a good question, Susan. How would team two steal the word? So at the end of the 30 seconds, when I say, okay, time's up, and team one wasn't able to, to get the term that's on the board, um, team two, um, how did I work that? I know that sometimes I have a steal, um, but you're right because they can all see the word. Um, I'm not sure. Okay, forget the stealing. Maybe I was thinking about something else. Thank you, Susan. Um, I think that maybe that was for a different game. Okay, strike that on my notes. Thanks, Susan. Did you have something to say? Yeah, I just wanted to add, um, for those of you that are having difficulty visualing, visualizing the game, it's kind of like the game show password where like the one partner knows what the word is and has to describe it to the other partner. Um, only instead of a partner, it's for the entire team. So it's one person that doesn't know the word and a team that does. All right. Okay, so this game has so many applications. You can do it for vocabulary words for any level. Um, you could use with pictures, you know. Um, so sometimes our chapters have visuals involved, depending on what we're uh, teaching. Um, I also thought of in some of the ABE classes, we do a novel study. So we could do it with characters and events, um, background for a story. So this would be a nice way to kind of really review that in a different sort of a way. Um, so, you know, for example, let's say you put a character up there. 
So you wouldn't, you might have to shift the rules a little. So you would just remind the class, you know, you need to use context from the story to try to describe it. So let's say we're using Cinderella. Okay, that was our novel study in our class. I would give the example to my class to say, you know, if I put Prince up on the board, you can't say blank William and Kate. Okay, because that has nothing to do with the story. So the requirements would be that you have to use the context from the story. So you would want to say something about, this is the person in the story who fell in love and sent soldiers from all over the kingdom to find the woman who could wear the shoe. Okay, so you always want to make sure to give them, you know, some examples, but that's a really neat way that you could use it for um, review for like a story that you have read in the class. So some of the adaptations I already talked about adapting this, um, you could let students use notes. You can also very easily adjust the time for the hot seat victims. You just want to keep it consistent, you know. I'll say this again, but I, when I, you know, in all my years of teaching, whether it was in the K-12 world or now, I always remind students, you know, at the end of the day, you guys, this is for review. Okay, so I'm going to do my best to make it fair and fun, but sometimes you'll have more competitive groups than others, you know. So, or sometimes you could allow one clue, but again, you'll want to make sure that you have those prepared before you do the game, typically. So, um, yeah, those are some ideas for that. Hot seat, love it. And then Graciela had asked, do we need to use different gestures with this game? Um, that would be an adaptation that you can use or not use. And a lot of people have commented on ways to make the point stealable. So thank you for that. Some people have suggested um, having one person from each team sit in the front. Um, someone else suggested having team number two give the person clues. And if they get it, then team two gets the point. So thank you for that. Uh, those contributions. Um, and then Megan said, I found with my ESL students, I have to tell them speak only English when I have played a game like this. Absolutely. Yes. So speak only English, no translations, no, you know, um, yeah, definitely. Thank you. Thank you for reminding us to say that, Megan, because that's a big, a big one. Absolutely. All right. So the next game we have is question dice. And this is exactly what it looks like. You can see two sets of dice. Um, the one kind of in the middle of the screen with all the different colors, those are question dice, which you can get fairly cheaply on Amazon. Um, and each color has kind of a theme, but those are mostly icebreaker questions. Things like, what's your favorite food? Or if you could, you know, travel anywhere in the world, where would it be and why? So those are great for icebreakers, for just conversation prompts, especially um, if you're teaching an ESL class and there's an activity that a bunch of students have finished early and the rest of the class is still working. Those are a really easy thing you can just give to those students so that they ha can have conversation prompts and they can talk to each other in English so they're still getting that listening and that speaking and that social component while their classmates are completing the activity. Um, and then you see at the top the who, what, when, why, where dice. And uh, those you can also buy. Or you can just use a regular dice and on the board write one equals who, two equals what, three equals where, and do it that way. You certainly do not have to purchase any special dice equipment for this game. Uh, but you can use this for um, obviously language arts or ESL. You can use as writing, speaking, or uh, creating a graphic. Um, sorry, graphic representations and modify as needed. So for some students that are working on questioning, you might want to apply it to a specific context. For example, you are reading a story in class and when the student rolls a Y, or a number four, which equals where, or something like that, they then have to come up with a question about the story they've read using that question word. And then the members of their group have to answer the question. Um, and Linda has told us that she's made her own question dice and has a pattern to cut and glue the dice. And then she makes questions and cuts and pastes them on the dice, which is also obviously very accessible. 
Um, and then for modification, source material is a potential modification. Which question words you use is a modification. If you're, um, you know, if you're just working on maybe who and when, then you could do something as simple as instead of dice, you can use, or you can use a dice and odd numbers are who and even numbers are when, right? Or when and where, just to kind of make it, um, you know, just a little bit less vast for the students that maybe are not working on all of their question words yet, or you haven't gotten into the story yet, or don't want that level of questioning yet, um, or you can just expand it a bit more. Uh, so that one is pretty straightforward. Okay, the writing game, Music Matters. And um, Ms. Klein, just real quick, just back to the stealing thing real quick. The last time I used this game, the stealing thing wasn't applicable for many reasons. But if I think back, letting the other team provide the clues to the person in the hot seat, that is how I used to do the stealing. So um, it just depends on the class. The last class that I was teaching, again, it wasn't applicable. We were using it for um, a review for a final. So I was finding that typically if the clue wasn't had, it's because the person in the hot seat, just like I just did, um, went blank. Um, but a lot of times if you're, you know, kind of using it more to review as a class, um, a lot of times it's because the team isn't necessarily familiar with it or remembering how to give the clues. So yeah, you can make a lot of adaptations for that. So moving on again to music matters. This can be used for, in, in many different places in your schedule for the night, but it also can be used um, for many different objectives, depending on how you'd like to utilize it. So for Music matter, Matters, you'll carefully select a song to start. You're gonna have students take out a blank sheet of paper, and then you'll play a song and have students write something that goes along with it. So those are the basic instructions for this game. But of course, the more we can communicate the expectations to the students, the better the result will be. But that depends on your objectives. Maybe you just want to get students focused on class or listening to music in English for the evening. So you're going to play a song that the lyrics are really clear and you just kind of want to bring them into class and have them do a free write and be listening to some some lyrics in English and writing whatever it is um, that it reminds them of or writing down as many words as they hear or um, writing down the words that you had studied the day before that were related to mood. So there's really a, a lot of different applications for that. So um, it could also be adjusted for more specific results. So you could talk to students about, and write on the board, of course, length requirements, perhaps some characters that must be included that are from a story that you were studying. So this idea of music matters is really an idea to kind of work across disciplines to bring some music into the class and have students use it to improve their writing skills. So ESL classes, you can, again, use it for describing the music, the mood, so perhaps it's related to some particular adjectives that you were studying in class, um, related to a story that was read, so what would a particular character think, perhaps, about the music. Um, also, in a lot of our classes, we could use require the use of particular vocabulary words that we're studying, three major adjectives to describe the song and why, and perhaps the students have to write one paragraph for each of those adjectives explaining why that describes the song. Then afterwards, you could have students add an introduction and a conclusion, and edit their writing to include some transitions, and there you're really starting or supporting a lesson about a five paragraph essay. So you could really use this to, you know, include a lot of different objectives. Um, for other classes, you could require descriptive details. You could have students pick a title to the song and then write a paper defending the title with specific details. So that really makes me think about um, practicing for the reasoning through language arts GED tests. So they really have to use their arguments and details and um, in their writing. So 
that is Music Matters. So you can provide lyrics to the students for an adaptation here. Um, you might have to play the song more than once for the class, depending on, on what you're using it for. And you can adjust your requirements as needed. Okay. I think while Tara has been talking, sorry, this is Heather. While Tara has been talking, I've been trying to um, answer all the questions that have been typed in. Rosa said that music is good for understanding figurative language. This is a really great way to um, to definitely incorporate uh, figurative language, descriptive language. Um, and then your last idea could be expanded by presenting learners with two songs. Yes, and Absolutely. lyrics so they can compare and contrast and support for the themes in the songs. Great idea. Yes, for those of you that may not have read my response, um, the question was kind of how are they describing it? So I said it could be something as simple as how does this make you feel, right? To something as direct as which, which character in our book do you associate with this song, would associate with the song and why? So that's another great suggestion to play a couple of different examples and kind of have the students, um, you know, explore how they would uh, anticipate the, the characters in the book reacting and why. Uh, and that obviously gets them to look for evidence, which is good for our, uh, well, the tests that they have to take. Mm -hmm. So, Absolutely. yeah, it's just kind of a, a more, um, I guess, a less formal way to, or well, let, it probably feels less formal to them, less formal way to assess their kind of descriptive and figurative um, language. And we can take it in so many directions. You know, it doesn't have to be over when the song stops playing. So like I said, with the idea, um, with the adjectives and describing the three adjectives that you, the students feel describe the song and then defining that adjective in three different paragraphs. After that, you can have the students edit to add transitions and add an introduction and a conclusion. So you can really take this in so many different directions depending on what you'd like to use it for. We hope you can use it in your classrooms. This next game, oh, classic, one of my favorites. So for your word game connoisseurs, this is really more like catchphrase, but we'll come back to that in a minute, actually. So for this game, we're gonna use, um, for this example, I'm gonna explain it using the idea that the students are studying for constitution test. However, we'll talk about some different ways it could be used. Um, for different topics. So you want to divide the class into groups of four or six. So four or six people in a group. And you'll tell these groups of four to six people to sit in a circle and then to split themselves into two teams. So team one and team two. So there'll be three people on team one, three team people on team two in each of the circles, and they'll want to alternate places with the other team. So in the circle, it's a team one person, then a team two, then a team one, then a team two. So tell them to each team to come up with a team name. And on the board, I write the rules of the game and sometimes their team names on the board so everyone can see. So the rules of the game are a little bit like the hot seat. So they can't, they're gonna be describing and trying to get the people on their team to say the term that's on a card, and I'll get there. The rules are they can't say starts with, they can't say rhymes with, and they can't say any part of the word. So, and you wanna remind them to be speaking English. Then, the teacher, or I have piles of cards with terms on them prepared. So of course, right now, the topic we're using is the constitution test. So I have a bunch of terms um, on there. So all the amendments, um, you know, and then I'd have article one, and then I, you know, would have three branches of government, and then I would have bill, and then I would have legislator, you know, all these different terms that are related to the constitution test. And so I have piles of cards with terms on them. And all these piles of cards, you know, are the same. So each team is going to get a pile of cards that's the same as the team before them. So I'm going to put these pile of cards in the middle of each of the circles. So I'm putting identical, quite large piles of terms in the middle of each circle. So I'll, I use my phone as a timer or the 
timer from catchphrase, the actual game called catchphrase. Sometimes I like to use that timer because it's not the same length each time. So it kind of keeps students on their toes. It's just a little fun way to, you know, amp up the excitement. So the first player, when I say go, the first player picks up a card and is trying to get only their team to guess the term on each card while following the rules. Once that person, once the team guesses or they pass, it goes to the next team and that person next to them picks up a card, tries to get their team to guess the term, um, and then it goes on and on and on until the buzzer goes off. And I always tell each player, you know, when you're done with the card, whether you decided to pass or your team guessed it, just put it in front of you. So when the buzzer goes off, each team goes through their cards to count the number that's guessed correctly. And then I write the scores on the board. So it just gets really exciting. A lot of times we have to take a break to tell the students to relax, but they just have some, in a fun way though, they just have so much fun with it. And it really encourages students to um, talk about and review these terms or definitions um, using the information that we've studied. So a lot of times they have to talk around what they want to say and really have to get people to guess. So um, yeah, the, the team with the most answers at the end wins. Sometimes I'll have them go back through it because they'll get different terms and different opportunities to review each item so you can kind of really use it depending on what kind of time frame you have. So some alternatives to this game, um, in your different circles of students that you have around the room, you can have everyone to guess each time and then the circle with the most correct answers would win. Okay, so they would still go around and each pick up a card and try to get the circle of people to guess the correct answer. Um, but, um, you know, they would just all kind of be working together and then the circle with the most correct answers would, would win. And again, I always tell students that at the end of the day, this is for their learning and for their review. Competition's fun, but you know, this is really to, to review and you know, it's a different way of learning and making it fun and, and so forth. So this is a really, really great activity. Um, if you're using, a lot of times, you know, I will write the little cards that I want the term, you know, the terms that I want students to study. Um, so sometimes I use vocabulary terms. I've done this with vocabulary. So actually we just have something going on, a question that came up in our Q&A box. So I've done this with vocabulary. So I make big piles of cards with vocabulary terms from throughout the class, not just the vocabulary section, you know, in our chapters, but I'll go through the stories that we've read and things that I, a lot of times if a vocabulary word comes up in class, um, I keep a running list of vocabulary words that come up in conversation organically in my ESL classes. So I will include those in the terms. So a lot of times I'll make up my own piles, but also Quizlet is a really great resource for terms. Um, if you are, ha if you do happen to be teaching a class with civics or um, social studies or constitution tests involved, Quizlet has a section called flashcards and if you go it, you'll see on the screen there's a little area with three dots and if you click on that it's print and it will print all the flashcards so you can just use the terms from the class the flashcards and there there are thousands of um, decks of vocabulary words for um, or on Quizlet so that's just something to consider so no there's one pile in the middle because um, as the students rotate, they all just pick from that middle pile. So someone from team one picks and tries to get their team to guess. And then once they pass or they get the answer, then the person next to them is naturally from team two because you would ask them to alternate spots. So good question. All right, let's go ahead and get this in and then we'll have some time for some more ideas or questions. This can be applied to math, science, anything that we're studying in class. It's simply called, simply called true, false, fix. So it could be a review of a lesson, a unit, comprehensive review for a final exam. 
Um, you could use it as an exit ticket for class for one day. So the basis of this game is the idea that students are given a statement. They must decide if the statement is true or false. If it's false, they must fix it so that it's true. So you could have a bunch of statements all prepared for review on one sheet of paper. You could use it as a group project. So group students, maybe they have different statements depending on differentiation that you need to do in your classroom. You could all have the same statement on the board and review it as a class. You could put it on the board, give students one minute to do it by themselves and go over it as a class. You could do this to include subject verb agreement for ESL classes. You could use this for grammar, uh, grammar review in any of our classes, ESL, AVE, ASE, content review questions concerning a story that was just read, historical events that you've studied. Some other adaptations you can use are allowing use of notes, perhaps telling students if you give them a prepared list of statements, how many statements are true and how many statements are false to start with. So this has been something that's been a really nice, you know, you can use it as a lengthy review or something as short as an exit ticket from class one day. And then our last slide is just really easy things to do with manipulatives. So all you'll really have to do for most of these is just cut up a, a bunch of strips of paper. Um, and the, you know, the advantage of the manipulatives is again, getting them up and moving and it kind of gives them a way to show what they know in a manner that's not necessarily um, what they're used to. So for manipulatives, you could have students put sentences in the correct paragraph order. And to do this, you would just write a big long paragraph, cut it up, make sure it's a clear paragraph with a very obvious opening and closing sentence, and then have the students arrange the, se the sentences accordingly. Um, on a more, on a simpler scale, you can have them put the words in the correct order in a sentence. You can have students, you know, on index cards, group legislative responsibilities by branch of government. You can also have the different branches of government up on the wall and have students go to that, you know, you could say a responsibility and then have students go to the area that they think it belongs to. So just kind of different ways real quick to have people up and moving, you know. So yeah, so you would put, um, you know, just different, uh, different responsibilities and then have them either put them in the group or on the side of the room uh, that is associated with that, um, that branch of government. Yes, you could do it with sticky notes. Um, if you have like big butcher paper, you can put it on that. Otherwise, you can just say that corner is legislative, that corner is judicial, that corner is executive and have them go and put them either on the wall or on a table in that corner. Um, you can have students put parts of a sequence or a process in the correct order, whether it's direct, such as um, uh, something, you know, cellular reproduction or something like that, or um, maybe you're looking at uh, the writing process and you want students to know that first they have to make a draft and things like that. You can do matching story elements with specific details, words with definitions, amendments and rights and freedoms. Um, and math equations with either answers or terminology that they support. So that's just an idea where, you know, you just, again, print it on cardstock or write it on index cards, cut it up and give it to the students to kind of mix and match just to get them up and moving. And it also gets them talking and working together, which is nice. And we can't forget the classic game with matching, which is putting the, let's say we're doing words and definitions, you can fill up some plastic Easter eggs, some with the words, some with the definitions, and the students have to go around and grab the Easter eggs and find the one that matches it. So I've always loved that game. Just a little simple throw out there. Um, we also have from Teresa, you can have the students sort a word on a sticky note by the correct vowel sound. Yes, you can definitely incorporate um, vowel sound pronunciation games, things like that. Um, hard and soft cheese and things, you know, um, that do target pronunciation. I think we've answered pretty much all the questions that have come up in the question box and on the chat. We have about three minutes left. So if somebody has any other questions and they would like to put them up there, this would be the time to do it. Um, while you do that, I am going to put this last slide up, which has my information and Tara's information. You can always email us directly. Um, additionally, just as a reminder, we will have the 
typed out instructions for each one of these games uh, posted on the COAB site with the webinar, and Liz will take care of that. It should be accessible in the next 48 hours. The Easter egg match game, it's basically, instead of just the index cards, they're in those little plastic Easter eggs, and they kind of have to find their pair. Um, so They have to talk to each other and find the person who has, like if they find a term, they have to find the person who found the description. So the students have to talk to each other and really organize um, you know, themselves and use conversation to find the matching term to their description or the matching description to their term. Thank you. And Rebecca asked you. if we have any ideas for incorporating science experiments without the mess of the actual experiment. Right now, off the top of my head, I can't think of any, but Rebecca, what I would love for you to do is email me specifically what um, what science concepts you're trying to teach, and then I am happy to come up with some ideas and email you back. Oh, that was Heather, by the way. <laughs> hey, Rebecca. Oh, and, and oh. no problem, Deborah. But Rebecca, the another one thing I can think of just off the top of my head is if you had a science um, concept that you're trying to teach, you could have the science experiment description that's complete. And then just to introduce it to see, have students draw upon prior knowledge, you could cut up the science experiment and have the processes all over the room, you know, the different parts of the process, and then I have tried, students try to put them in order. So that might be a nice way to introduce a concept or um, talk about it a little bit and then have the students try it out. So. Thank and then Erica guys. wanted more ESL games, and I just want to say that any of these can be adapted. It just depends on what content you're looking for. So, for example, the question ball um, can be very kind of general questions depending on what you're targeting. Um, if they're working on directions, you can put a map up and say, you know, what building is east of the bank, um, you know, and just use the question game that way. Um, for hot seat, it can be vocabulary terms. Um, Really, any of these can be adapted. Again, feel free to email us with more specific questions, and we're happy to answer them. I know we only have one minute before we are cut off, but Lorraine suggested Scrabble with smaller groups. I always have Scrabble. Battleship for understanding the coordinate plane is a great idea. Um, so definitely, while you wait those 48 hours for our stuff to be uploaded, then please feel free to um, peruse the chat because a lot of you had some great ideas that you threw up there. So thank you for your contributions as well. Thank you so much, guys. Sorry, I was. <laughs> you guys are just rolling the question so well. I appreciate it. Um, we had a great time today with you. And please definitely email Heather or Tara. Um, or you can email me at coordinator at coab.org if you have any coab related questions. Uh, thank you so much, and we'll see you next time. Thanks. Thank you.